Welcome to this video. This video is about CSS, cascading style sheets. We use CSS on every web page we built and still a lot of people use things they learned on Stack Overflow and so on. They don't really know why they're doing something in a certain way. And that limits your capability of solving problems and implementing styles you haven't implemented before. This video is a thorough introduction to CSS and it's an excerpt from a Udemy course I created together with a colleague of mine. In that course, we dive much deeper into CSS. We also dive into topics like Flexbox, CSS Grid, CSS Variables, fun stuff like that. But this video here already is a thorough introduction, which probably also includes some things you didn't know before. So I hope you like it. If you want to join the full course, a link to it with a huge discount attached to it can be found in the video description. Welcome to this module. So let's dive right into it and let's get started with the basics of CSS. To be precise in this module, you will learn how you can add CSS to HTML to really ensure that your page looks good and which different options you have when it comes to that. We'll then dive into how you may set up CSS rules. So after you learn how to add CSS, how you actually write CSS code to, well, change something on your page. We'll then dive deeper into selectors, properties and values because these things turn out to be important when it comes to writing CSS rules. And finally, besides a couple of other things that are related to the previous topics, we'll also have a look at how we can actually resolve conflicting styles. So a lot to cover, let's get started. So to get started, attached to this video, you find the following files, the index.html file and the favicon.png file. Now the favicon is only there so that we have it, it's not related to CSS. The index.html file is the important one, it's the first piece of the course project we're going to build. If you open it with your favorite editor or IDE, I am using Visual Studio Code here, then you can see that we get a normal HTML5 skeleton inside of that file. We got a doc type, we got the HTML opening and closing tag, then we got a head section where we set some meta tags as well as a title. And since we're building a fictional web hosting company or the website of this company, we named it uhost. And you have the body tag. Now the body tag of course holds the content of our web page and right now this really is just a main tag, a section tag and in there this h1 tag. So not too exciting but we'll add more and more throughout this course of course. This is already some great code with which we can get started though which is the reason why it's there. Now all these things here are default HTML selectors. And now if we open that web page, if we double click on that index.html file and we open it in the browser therefore, we should see something like this. The exact thing you see here might differ depending on which browser you use. I'm using Chrome. I strongly recommend using Chrome because of its developer tools which we'll also use later. But this is what you should roughly see. Just some text which has actually some styling. It's a bit bigger than the default text would be. It is fat but it doesn't look super great and there certainly is more we can do with it. So this is our starting setup and our goal is to turn this into this. So as you can see, what we have here is some background color of the surrounding element as it looks like and the text is then inside of that background and also looks a bit differently. This is achieved via CSS not via HTML because HTML leads to what we see here. It's about the content and the structure of our page in the end and we got all of that. We got the content there, we can read it. This page, although it doesn't have that many features right now, is fully usable. This is super important to understand. It's fully usable. So what we can now do is we can make it more beautiful. And for that we can use CSS. Now in the next video, we'll dive into using CSS and I will show you three different ways of adding CSS code to this page. So let's add some CSS to this page. And as I mentioned, there are three different ways of adding CSS. The first way you can use is inline styling. 
Now let's say we want to style this section here. We can add an inline style by adding the style attribute to the section tag. The style attribute is a normal HTML attribute which you can actually add to pretty much any HTML element. Now you can simply set a CSS style by now applying a so-called CSS declaration inside of that style attribute or inside of that string you pass as an argument, I could say. A declaration simply means that you define what you want to style and how you want to style it. Now the what is called a property. And here we could say we want to set the background of this section. Now how do I know that there is a background property? As you will learn throughout the course, there first of all is a list of some properties you commonly use. So you will really see that you reuse the same set of properties all the time. And I will also show you a complete reference of all available properties so that you can really search for that single property you need for your case. But back to the background. As you might be able to guess, the background property styles the background of this section. And we could set it to a value. Now this is the part where we say how it should be styled. We assign such a value by adding a colon after the property and then the value to which we want to set the background. Now which value you use here depends on the property. So for backgrounds, for example, we can assign a color. There also are other options like images, which I'll also show later, but for now let's use a color. And you can either assign a color like red, just by typing this, there is a set of predefined colors, so to say, but behind each such predefined color, there really is just a hex code you can use. And if you directly assign a hex code, you can actually mix or blend any color you want. A hex code is assigned by adding a hashtag and then the hex code value for a given color. I will show you how to find out the hex code value later. So for now, let's simply add one. And I prepared one which has the hex code FF1B68. This is a nice reddish color. Now if we save this file and we go back to the page and reload it, you should see that this section now has a red background. And that already is your first CSS code. This is how you can change the style of an element, in this case of the section. Now this was achieved by creating a so-called inline style. Inline because we use the style attribute directly on the element where you want to add it. And you would write all styles, if you have multiple ones, you can separate them with semicolons, in the same line. Now this approach is actually not recommended. Because if you create a bigger page with many styles, it quickly becomes very hard to understand and read your code. Because your style is always applied to the element you want to change, if you ever want to change a style, you have to find that element in your document flow and this is really hard to debug. Additionally, if you add multiple rules, let's say you have like 10 different properties you want to change, you get a very long list of properties you assign here and that also is hard to read. So there is a better way of writing CSS and that way actually uses so-called selectors. Let's dive into that approach and then the two remaining alternatives of including CSS code in the next video. So since we learned that inline styles are bad, let's find a better alternative. I removed the inline style and the first alternative I want to show you uses the head section. There you can add a special style tag. So it's a normal HTML tag with the name style. And between the opening and closing selector, you can now write so-called CSS rules. Now a CSS rule in the end includes the same property value assignment we used on the section. It just adds one extra thing because if you just write background and then your color here like FF1B68, of course, CSS would have no chance of knowing what you want to style with that color. You don't attach it directly to the element. So what you need to add is a so-called selector. A selector simply is an additional piece of information that tells CSS to which element in your DOM, so inside of your body, and the body is also treated as an element by the way, to which element you want to assign this declaration. So where you want to change the background in our case. You add a selector 
by simply typing the tag name without the lower than and greater than signs. So just section our case. Then you add opening and closing curly braces to now mark the part where you will set up the rules or the declarations for that given selector. Because you can of course add multiple selectors for different elements on your page. So in our case, I would grab that background code and put it inside of these curly braces. And now I'm telling CSS, and CSS executes automatically, it's run by the browser, so to say. I tell it that it should look for all section elements on the page. We only have one, but it would actually use all. And apply this style to all found instances, so to all sections on the page. So if I now save this, and I reload the page, we don't actually see a difference, which makes sense because we still styled this element, but now no longer via inline styles, but by directly adding a style in our template or in our head section like this. Now, as I mentioned, this applies to all sections. So if you add a second section, and we'll need one in our project later, if you add a second section here, and let's say in this section we have another h1 tag where we say choose your plan because later this will be the part where users can select their hosting plan. If we do this and we save the file and we reload, you see both sections actually have that style. You also see there is some white space between them and around them. I will come back to why that is the case later. But now you can already see that selector doing work. You write the rule once and you select all sections. That's another advantage compared to inline styles where you would have to add this declaration to each section separately. And if you ever change the color, you would have to change it in all these section styles. So that is the better way for many reasons. Now there is one other way of including styles though. And that is using an external style sheet. So let's do that now. For that, I'll add a new file to the project. You can create it in your Windows Explorer or Apple Mac Finder, of course, or directly in your IDE, as I do. And in that new file, we will store the CSS code. Hence, the file should end with .css, because it contains CSS code. The name is up to you. I will name it main, because it refers to the main page of our web application, of our web page. But you can pick any name you want. Now, in that file, you write your CSS rules. Remember, a rule is this part, which is composed of a selector, a property, and a value. So you grab that rule, and then you put it into that CSS file. Without the style tags, that's important. We're not in an HTML file, so we don't need style tags. With that added, we can remove the style tags from the index.html file, and now we can save both files. So the changed index.html file and the new main.css file. If we then go back to the running page and we reload it, you see the styles are gone. And do you have an idea why this is happening? It of course happens because in our index.html file, we never specify that we want to use or include this main.css file. And how would our browser know? It doesn't automatically scan our file system and include every file it finds. So we have to explicitly tell it to use the main.css file. And we do so by adding a link element, so normal link element as we use it for the fab icon, with rel set to style sheet to inform it that we're including a style sheet here. And then the hyperreference added with the href attribute should point to that file. If that file would live in a subfolder, then you would add subfolder slash file name but since it's in the same folder here, we just put the file name, so main.css. If we now save that index.html file and we reload, the styles are back because now we're including the styles through our file here. And with that, you learned the third way of including CSS. This actually is the recommended way because by using an external style sheet, you can have a clear separation of your HTML and your CSS code, which is especially useful as your CSS code grows and would bloat your head section at some point. And additionally, if you use the same style sheet in multiple pages, let's say, then your browser can cache the style sheet and doesn't need to re-download it for every new page. Whereas if you include your styles in the head section, you increase the file size of your HTML file, 
and the browser needs to re-download it, since it's part of the HTML page, for every new page, which can be slower. That is why in this course, we will use an external style sheet, even if we only have one rule, as in this case. We added the first styles to our website and this already improved the look a little bit, at least it did something on the screen, but beautiful still is different, I'd say. So for one, we should style different things, like our font we use, I don't think this font is very beautiful, and maybe the color of the text as well. And the positioning of the text in this surrounding area maybe is also something we can change. So these are the next things we want to do. Additionally, I also don't want to use the same styles on both sections because both sections will actually have very different purposes and styles in our web page. So these are the two things I want to focus on next. How we can change different things than just the background. So how we can, for example, change that text inside of that background or in that element having that background and how we can apply different styles to different sections. So let's start with the different styles thing because that instantly yields a nice effect. And let's say we want to change the font family, so the way the font looks like, as well as the color of this H1 tag. Now for this, what we can do is we can add a new selector to our CSS file. And in this case, it would be the H1 selector because we want to change the text in this H1 element. So I guess it makes sense to use that H1 selector. Now we again add the curly braces. And now we did change the background in the past of the entire section actually. Now I wanna change things about that H1 tag, about the text itself. And the two things I mentioned were the color and the font family. Now let's start with the color. You change the color of the text with the color property. And again, if you're wondering how I know that, by experience, because as I mentioned, you work with the same set of properties a lot and it will also show you that reference I was talking about. But for now, let's just use color here and let's set a color of white for now. If we save that and we reload the page, we see all, so both H1 tags turned white, which again makes a lot of sense because with the H1 selector, we select all and not just one H1 element. So this is, for now, at least one change, we did set the color to something different, to white in our case. But there still is more we can do. I was talking about changing the font. So for this, we need to change the font family. So you can go to that H1 tag and add font-family as an additional property. This changes, well, you guessed it, the font family of this text, so of this H1 tag. And now here, you got a couple of choices. You can use a default font family like sans serif. This is a special keyword which will use the default setup in your browser. If you reload the page, you see indeed the style did change. Now, where is this coming from? Now, for this, we should open our browser preferences. In these preferences, and that of course depends on your browser, but in Chrome, you got the customized fonts area and each browser should have something like this. If you click it, you see some custom settings about your fonts and now here's the interesting part. You also see a standard font, which is used by default, that was the font you saw at the beginning, times in my case. Then you got a font with serifs, if you're saying I want a serif font, or if you want a sans serif font, it'll use Helvetica in my case. And that of course may differ on your system. Fixed width is an additional default, which you often use for code snippets. You always see a preview of the font below the dropdown, at least in Chrome. So these are the default settings and you target them by either not assigning a font family, which will use the standard font, by setting it to serif, to sans serif, or here, this would be mono space actually. But more on this in a special section later in the course. So for now, what we did is we set it to sans serif and hence in my case, it uses Helvetica. And therefore, we get a different look already. Now you're not limited to using font families included on your system. However, sans serif, serif and monospace are always great values because they will use the browser defaults. So you can rely on these keywords, picking a font 
that looks at least to some extent in the way you want because you can ensure it's a sans serif or a serif font as you fall back to the browser defaults for that kind of font. Sometimes you want a specific font though and you can't rely on that font being installed on the machine of the user. So to include a font which is not necessarily installed already, you can use a tool called Google Fonts. If you search for Google Fonts, you should find this result here, fonts.google.com. And on this page, you can see a lot of fonts which you can easily include on any web page. Now, I already found one which I want to use for this project, so let's search for Anton. And here, Anton looks like this. Now you can add it to your project by clicking the plus which will open this part here at the bottom. And if you expand this, you see two things. An import link, which you need to add to your HTML head section, and the rule by which you can apply this font. So let's grab the import link. Let's go to our index.html file and add it above our main CSS import here so that we can use that font in the main.css file. And thereafter, let's use font family. So let's copy that rule. And in our main.css file, let's replace this font family declaration here with that. So if we now save that and we leave Google Fonts and we reload the page, you see that the font changed once again because now we're using that externally imported font. And since we're dynamically importing it with that link, you can rely on it being loaded on any machine for any of your users. So this is how we change the color and the font family. This, in my opinion, improved the look, though it would also be nice to have some spacing inside of that box and on the other hand, maybe get rid of that spacing around it. And it would be nice if we didn't share the styles between the two sections, because as I mentioned, they should look different. So that's a lot of work. Let's start with the different styles for the different sections. We took our first steps when it comes to styling by assigning properties and values for the properties. Now, the next step is to ensure that we don't apply the same styles all over our page. Sometimes you want this. Sometimes you want every H1 tag to look the same. For example, when it comes to its font size, that's a pretty common thing. But sometimes, like in this case, you don't want that. Semantically, we got two H1 uh, tags, but they should look different here. Now, right now, we always select the same section and the same H1 tag. Thankfully, we have more than just the tag selectors which we're currently using in CSS. So let's see which other selectors we have. We did have a look at the so-called element or tag selectors. There, we set the equal styles for all these elements and it looks like this. In HTML, we got a couple of elements and the H1 tag here would have a red text because of this rule. We select the H1 tag and we assign a color of red. Now that is what we saw thus far, but there is more. For example, we also have class selectors. Classes are something you might have never heard before because they are a concept strongly connected to CSS. With classes, we can define a style, which we then apply to all elements that have the same class. And a class is added to an element in HTML by adding the class attribute, as you can see here. In this snippet, all the elements actually have the blog post class. Now, the blog post class is not something which is predefined by the browser. You define classes instead. In CSS, the code would look like this. Please notice that this selector is a bit different than the tag selector. It starts with a dot and then your class name. And you're free to choose any class name you want. Here, the color is then also set to red. That's the declaration and that rule. And therefore, all HTML elements that have this class will get the red text color. Now, sometimes you also want to set a certain style for all elements on the entire page. And in this case, you have the universal selector. So here's an example where we have one element without a class and one with a class. And let's say the top two rules wouldn't exist. So the only rule we could then add to turn everything red would be this one. With the star selector, you style every element on your page. And to be honest, you rarely use this one. The reason is you rarely want to have the same style on every single element on your page. There is one specific use case, we'll also have a look at later though, where this makes sense. Now we're not done yet though. There are two other kinds of important selectors. ID selectors, for example, 
allow you to select elements by the ID they have and then apply a style to that one specific element. Since an ID only exists once on a page, we only apply the style to one single element. In HTML, it would look something like this. Here we have an h1 tag with an ID, main title in this case. The ID, of course, can be anything you want. And then in CSS, you would target it by adding a hashtag in front of the ID name. And then again, you define the rule, so the declarations for that rule to be precise. And this would turn this text red in this snippet here. Now, the last type of selector, of main selectors you have, are attribute selectors. There, you select HTML elements by the attribute they have. And this again can select multiple elements, unlike the ID selector, which only selected one. Here, you set the equal style to all elements with the same attributes. In HTML, here we would have a button with the disabled attribute, a standard HTML button attribute you can set. And in CSS, you would select all buttons or all elements with the disabled attribute by enclosing the attribute name in square brackets, that's just the syntax CSS uses, and then assigning your declarations. So this CSS code would assign a red text to all elements, no matter if they're buttons or not, which have a disabled attribute. This is a little bit of theory. We will see all these selectors throughout the course. Thus far, we only use the element selector, but maybe one or multiple of the other selectors can help us with our problem of styling the things we have on our page right now differently. So back in our code, right now we only use the element selector. Section H1, these are element selectors. Now I said I wanna have different styles. So for example, what we could do is we could assign IDs to these sections. We could add an ID here to the first section and maybe name it product-overview. The name of the ID is totally up to you. Now, IDs are not an attribute which you only add because you want to style the element. IDs also allow you to add a hashtag at the end of your URL and the browser will immediately jump down to that element in the page. So it will scroll down there, so to say. But they can also be used for styling, as you will see. Let's also assign an ID to the second section. Maybe let's call this one plans because I plan on adding my plans here. So the plans the user may choose from. So now we got two IDs and this allows us to adjust our rules. Instead of selecting a section and setting the background to this color, I only want to do this for the first section, which has the ID of product overview. So let's copy that ID name and let's replace this section element selector here with the hashtag product overview selector. If we now save both files, so CSS and HTML, and we reload the page. You see, the second one seems to be gone, but actually the text is just white still, so we don't see it. But the first one now is the only one with the reddish background. This already shows us a big advantage of using different selectors. The ID selector only matches elements with that ID, and semantically, an ID should only occur once on a page. So it only selects this section and therefore only applies the styles there. Now, if we want to have a different style for the second section, we could of course target it with that plans ID. However, for the second section, for now I actually don't want to change the section as a whole, it's just the h1 tag. Now there are actually multiple ways of getting access to this h1 tag in the second section. One way we can do it is by adding a class to the h1 tag. So let's add a class by adding the class attribute and let's name it section-title. Again, the class name is up to you, though I do recommend that you pick class names, which first of all use the kebab case, so where you have lowercase names where the words are separated with dashes. This is important because CSS is case insensitive. So something like section title written like this, which is readable to humans, is the same like section title like this. And therefore it can be harder to ensure you're not overwriting class names. Hence, kebab case is recommended. And the second thing which is important about classes is you can reuse them. Unlike IDs, you don't just use them once. You can add them multiple times and a class is always a good choice if there is a decent chance of you reusing it. Otherwise, an ID might maybe be better, though you can always use classes if you want. Here, I defined my class, the name is up to you, 
And with that, we can go to the main.css file and I'll leave that h1 selector for now, but I'll also add a third selector now with a dot at the beginning and then the class name. This is a so-called class selector. And then in the rule set, I'll add a declaration where I set the color to another color. Here I'll use hashtag 2ddf5c, another color I picked in advance. It's a nice green, which will be our main theme color of this project. If we now save both files, CSS and HTML, and we reload the page, now we actually see that the second H1 tag has that green color because we did use a different selector. Now on the slide I showed you, there were other selectors too, and we will encounter these throughout the course too. But for now, this is a great first step when it comes to ensuring that our things look differently. These selectors we use right now, the ID selector, the tag selector, and the class selector are already three very important selectors, which you will see a lot in your CSS code. In the last lecture, we added different selectors to ensure that our second section and h1 tag doesn't look like our first one. Now maybe there's one thing you did wonder about. We do set the h1 tag to have a white color and then we set the section title class to set a green color. Now actually both selectors here match our second h1 tag. We still have our h1 selector in place here so it still selects the second h1 tag too. It doesn't stop selecting it just because we added a class. And then the class seems to override this. Now you could argue this happens because the section title class is defined after the tag selector and as the file probably is parsed from top to bottom, which it is, this simply overrides the previous rule. You would not be entirely wrong by this, though actually if you switch the order, just for demo purposes here, and you reload the page, you see that the styling still applies. So the class still overrides the h1 tags style. On the other hand, if you quickly assign the h1 tag again and set the font family back to serif and not to Anton, and now you save and reload, you see the h1 tags get changed. So the font did change. So the order does seem to matter, but only if you use the same selector. The class still overrides the color, so that's really strange. And there's one additional strange thing. If the class somehow overrides the styling for the h1 tag, so if it still sets the green color, why doesn't it also clear the font family? Now we set it back to serif manually here with the second rule, but even before we did this, and it becomes clearer if we set this to sans serif, like this, now it's uh, changed to sans serif style, but not back to Anton. Now you can still see the section title doesn't seem to clear the font family. It clearly overrides the color, but it doesn't reset the font family. So it still keeps that style around. So there are two things are going on here. Multiple rules seem to affect the same element. And additionally, the different rules here seem to have different priorities. Because otherwise, how would we explain that this section title class overrides the color even though it comes before we set up the other rules? Now let's explore what's going on here. And for that, we'll use the developer tools. You can open the developer tools by pressing Command, Option and I on Mac or F12 on Windows. Or you open it from the menu of your browser. Here I'm talking about the Chrome developer tools, by the way. Now in the developer tools, you get a couple of options in case you never work with that. If you click on elements, you see your HTML code, so to say, and you can select elements by expanding and clicking there. And then at the bottom, you si see which styles are getting applied to these elements. You can also select an element from within your page by right-clicking on it and choosing inspect. This also works if the developer tools are closed, they will open then. If they are opened, it will just jump to that element and select it, as you can see here. And you can also pick that tool here on the top left of the developer tools and now click on element in your DOM to also quickly inspect it. Now if we do that on that h1 tag in our second section and we bring this up a bit here, we can actually see which styles are getting applied. 
And the list here has to be read from top to bottom with the topmost style taking the highest priority. Now there you see a couple of styles are indeed getting applied. If you scroll down, these are all styles that are applied to that H1 tag. You see the topmost is actually an empty style. That would be the inline style if you add the style attribute to the H1 tag. Because it turns out that inline styles have the highest priority. Or this concept is also called specificity to be precise. But then you see that the class selector section title appears. So it seems to have a higher specificity than the H1 selectors which are coming below it. You see two H1 selectors because we got two in our CSS code. And if you watch closely, you see the second one with just the font family sans serif has a higher priority or specificity than the first one simply because it comes second in the file and the file is parsed top to bottom. But again, as already recognized, the section title class overrides them both, even though it comes earlier in the file, but internally by the CSS specification, it seems to have a higher specificity, and it does. If you scroll down further, there also are some browser defaults for that element. And these have the lowest priority, they do apply though, but you can override them. And that is something we will also do later. So these are the styles which are getting applied. The fact that we have multiple rules affect the same element is the cascading part of the name we are, of the feature we're using here. CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And cascading simply means multiple styles can be applied or multiple rules can be applied to the same element. Now these rules may lead to conflicts though. Here for example, we got our color set up in the H1 tag and in the section title class. Now to resolve such conflicts, CSS knows a concept called specificity. And there are clear rules included in the CSS specification that define how such conflict should be resolved and which type of selector has a higher specificity. Now here's an overview. As I said, cascading means multiple rules are applied to the same element. Specificity resolves conflicts arising from that fact and specificity then simply has the following order. The tag selector and also pseudo element selectors, which we haven't had a look at yet, but which we will see in the course, have the lowest priority, the lowest specificity. Well, actually the universal selector, that star has the lowest priority, but you rarely use that. So tag selectors have the lowest one then. A higher specificity is assigned to class and pseudo class as well as attribute selectors. So these three are all in the same level and if we then have two conflicts here, simply the latter one in the same file wins, just as we had it for the two H1 tags in our CSS file. Now pseudo classes are also something we'll see later in the course. Uh, this is something like controlling hover effects on an element. So if you mouse over it. A higher specificity is assigned to ID selectors. So if an element has a tag, a class and an ID selector, and they all set the color of that element, the ID selector would actually win no matter where it is positioned in the CSS file. The highest priority, however, is assigned to inline styles. We saw that earlier, but we shouldn't use them. But if you add them, they will actually override all other styles. They have the highest specificity. Now there are more rules connected to specificity, some advanced things connected to things like inheritance, which we hadn't a look at yet. But these rules here are important to keep in mind. Tag selectors have the lowest specificity, inline styles have the highest. Now this doesn't mean that you should always use inline styles. It just means you should be aware of this and you should style your page cleverly by actually using all these types of selectors, maybe without inline styles though and simply be aware of how they override each other. And it's actually not hard to work with these correctly and we will do it throughout the entire project so there is a lot of space for you to practice it. So back to code then, let's see how this actually has an impact in reality and what else is connected to this concept. So we explored specificity in the last lecture. You had that slide where I showed it to you. And with that it's clear why the second text is actually green and why it is sans serif. Now let's get rid of that sans serif style here, the H1 tag. We don't need it, I'll comment it out. And if I now reload it, we got Anton back. 
we still have that green color because of that specific thing. Now there is something else related to all of that and this is called inheritance. Now inheritance means that an element also inherits some styles of the parent element. We don't use inheritance in our project yet. So let's add it to the project and let's add it by setting a global default font so that the text in our project has a global font. I actually don't want to use Anton for all the H1 tags and therefore to ensure that this and other texts on the page and we will add more text have a different font, we should set up a global rule. Now for one, we could of course add the star selector to give any element a certain look. There we could set a font family of sen serif like this. And if we save this and reload, well, you would see we still have Anton here because the h1 tag comes second. So let's move the star selector after the h1 tag and save and reload. And we still have Anton because if we inspect it, we see the star selector has the lowest priority. Now this actually is something which would not be the problem here. The problem with the star selector is that it's very inefficient the way CSS has now to parse all our elements on the screen. So we will use it but not for a global font family. For that you instead typically use something different. You style the body. Keep in mind the body wraps all your other content so if you set a certain style on the body, maybe it will also change the style of your other elements. So for the body, we can set a font family. And actually I don't want to use sans serif, but another Google font, so let's quickly head there. And I wanna use Montserrat. Simply click on the plus again, then expand this. And here I'll quickly also go to customize and add the bold version of the font by clicking bold. And if I now go back to embed, here's the adjusted import. Simply grab that link, go back to your project and add it below or in front of the other font import. And now we can use that font family here too. So let's copy that rule. Let's close the tab. And in main CSS, I'll assign this to my body. Now, if we save this and reload, again, no change. However, this is a better way of doing this because it's more efficient. And theoretically, it would get applied to that H1 style here. If you scroll down in the applied styles and you go below the browser default, you will actually see that inherited from body section and elements inherit styles from their parents, direct or indirect parents, and not just from the body. The body clearly is no direct parent of H1, but it is a parent in the chain of elements here. And therefore, some styles, not all, there are exceptions, but we'll dive into this later. Some styles, especially the font related styles, are passed down to Charles. However, inheritance has a very low specificity. Inheritance always comes at the bottom, even below the browser defaults. Put in other words, styles that are applied because an element is selected directly, be that through an element selector, a class selector, an ID selector, the universal selector, an attribute selector. Whenever you directly select an element, this has a higher specificity than inheritance, where you don't directly select an element. However, if we were to add a paragraph here in the index.html file, maybe in the second section below the h1 tag, where we say make sure you get the most for your money. If we add this and now reload the page and we inspect this paragraph, you actually see it does have that style being applied. It's not strike through, it's not overwritten and therefore Montserrat is applied here. And you can check this by quickly ticking this style off by clicking the checkbox. Now it changed back to times to the browser default and now it's back to Montserrat. So inheritance is an important concept for passing styles down without explicitly selecting an element. And especially for things like font sizes, font families, this is extremely useful because you typically want to have one at the same style for the majority of your text on your screen. And therefore setting this up in the body section is a great way as it will then make sure you can use inheritance.
Again, that's not limited to the body section. It works with any parent, but if you want to have it for the entire page, the body section obviously is a great place. Important though, inheritance works, but any direct selector has a higher specificity and therefore will overwrite your inheritance if it defines the same property as we do here with the font family Anton on the H1 tag. So we saw the concept of inheritance in action. How can we now ensure that our choose your plan H1 tag actually doesn't get the same style as the H1 tag in the first section in the product overview? Now we get that same style, we get Anton and the white color, which we override with the class, but not the font family. We get it because of that H1 selector. We can verify this if we inspect that H1 tag, the green one. Here you can see the H1 selector is passing this font family. I don't want that, I want to use the default one. Since I want to use the default, there are two ways of solving this. The first one is that we also go to section title and set font family to inherit. This is a special keyword which simply means please use the inherited style Basically, you can think of that increasing the specificity of inheritance for that specific property only though. This will work since we have section title on the second H1 tag. So if we save this, we can reload the page and now we actually get a different style here. If you inspect this now, you see font family inherit is taking effect and that actually is Montserrat as you can see if you tick it off. Even though that seems to be not used, it actually is because of the inherit keyword. But this is not necessarily the best way. If we ever have another H1 tag, which maybe has a different class, but also should use the default font family, we have to add font family inherit on that class too. Would be nicer if we could do the opposite and simply say, hey, this H1 tag in the first section, that should be the only one that gets this font family instead of all H1 tags by default. So instead of excluding anything that does not get it, we should simply only include this first H1 tag. Now, of course, one way of doing that would be to simply assign a class or ID to that H1 tag. So we could name this first section title, but that's a really dumb class name because it's probably not getting reused. So a class might not be the best choice. And if we ever add a first section, we should rename this to second section as it wouldn't make sense otherwise. Now we could turn it to an ID and now the reusing thing wouldn't be a problem. An ID wouldn't be super bad here, but we already have an ID on the section. Semantically, maybe we don't want to add one here. And still we have the naming issue. So one other thing we can use is a so-called combinator. A combinator allows us to combine multiple selectors to be more precise about what we want to select. We can add a combinator to that H1 selector to narrow down which type of H1 tags we want to select. And we can say we want to select any H1 tag that is inside of an element with the ID product overview. So in our app that is inside of that first section. We add such a combinator by, or we combine this selector, so to say, by adding the other selector that matters to us. In our case, this ID selector. We add it in front of the H1 tag. So this can be read as any H1 tag inside of product overview. And actually H1 doesn't have to be a direct child. There could be elements in between. So you could have a wrapping div that would still work. I'll quickly add one for demo purposes. If you save this now and you reload the page, you see you got the same styles as before, even if you go back to main CSS and remove the font family inherit property declaration from section title. So even if you remove that and you reload the page, you will see the second H1 tag still has a different font because now if you inspect the first one, only this one gets the font family Anton because now here we have a selector that only targets H1 elements that are nested somewhere inside an element which has the product overview ID, which of course only is the case for our first section in our app here. Now again, 
The div here was only used to demonstrate that it doesn't have to be a direct child. We can remove it and it will of course still work. And what we're using here is a so-called combinator because we combine multiple selectors. As a side note, if you use combinators, you also create a higher specificity. So if you still had a h1 tag after that, let's reintroduce the old one with sans serif, then you should still see that Anton gets applied. Let me show this to you by reloading the page. If you inspect the first font here, the first h1 tag, you see we still have font family Anton because our hashtag product overview h1 selector has a higher specificity, as you can tell by the order in the developer tools, than just the h1 tag. Even though the h1 tag comes second, so it comes later in the file. But, and that is the last important piece about specificity, the rule with more information to it, so to say, and this has more information because we narrow down which h1 tags we want to style, the rule with more information, like this one, wins over rules with less information, like this one. So the more specific rule has a higher specificity. Makes sense, I guess. Also, don't mistake this with inheritance. We're not inheriting a style from product overview here. We're setting a style only for h1 tags that happen to be inside product overview. It's not the same as inheritance because this is not passed down automatically. We're explicitly selecting h1 tags here. So this is the last piece about specificity and this is what combinators are. Now there are more combinators. Let's explore them in the next video. In the last lecture, we had a first look at combinators, at one combinator to be precise. Now there are more combinators, four very important ones to be precise. Now combinators allow us to be more clear about our rules and select elements by passing more information to the selector. Now you can combine multiple selectors, not just two as a side note, and as I mentioned, you can combine them with four important types of combinators. The first one is the adjacent sibling combinator. The second one is the general sibling combinator. Then we have the child combinator and the descendant combinator. Now how do they look like? Here are some CSS snippets. The first one, the adjacent sibling, is added by adding a plus between the selectors you want to combine. And again, these could be more than two. You could add more to this list. So it could be div plus p plus a to select anchor tags that are well connected to the paragraph in div, but how are they connected? That's something we'll explore in just a second. General sibling uses the tilde sign here between the selectors we want to combine. Child uses a greater than sign and descendant uses a white space. And this is the one we used in the last lecture. Now, what do they do in detail? The adjacent sibling selector simply is defined like this. Again, you could, as for all selectors, combine multiple ones. And it simply assigns a style as shown in this example. Here we set a red color. It assigns it to all paragraphs that directly follow a h2 tag, which is why the first and last paragraph get the red color here and the second one doesn't because the second one follows a h3 tag, which is in between the h2 tag and the paragraph, and therefore it's not a direct sibling of the h2 tag. The plus requires a direct sibling ship, so to say though, and therefore only direct siblings get the red color. Now, if you were to combine more than two selectors, so h2 plus p plus a, then only anchor tags next to paragraphs that are next to h2 tags would get the red color. So elements have to share the same parent here. That's also an important thing to keep in mind. They have to be on the same level. And the second element or third or whatever you're selecting has to come immediately after the first or second, whatever you're selecting element. The general sibling selector is connected to that, but more flexible. It looks like this, this is the syntax. And here's a code snippet. Here, all paragraphs get the red color even though the second one doesn't directly follow a h2 tag. For the general sibling, it's only important that there is a h2 sibling. Doesn't have to be directly in front of it, just a h2 element on the same level as the paragraph in this case. This is the general sibling. So important thing here, you have to have the same parent and the second element comes after the first one, but it doesn't have to come directly after it.
The child combinator uses that greater sign and that rule would change the following HTML code to have a red color on the first and last paragraph but not on the one which is nested inside the article. Because this child combinator says any paragraph that is a direct child of a div should get that style. Now again, you can use multiple here, not just two. You could also say uh, anchor tag inside a paragraph inside a div where each element is a direct child of the other should get a certain style. And that allows you to be very precise about which child you want to target. This is not the combinator we used in the last lecture because there I showed you that it doesn't matter if you have a direct parent or not. So this only applies styles if you are a direct child of an element. The last one, which is the one we used, is the descendant combinator, just a white space. And here, the level on which you are doesn't matter. Here in this example, all paragraphs get the red color, no matter if they are a direct child of the div or not. Simply because here it just matters that there is a div somewhere above them in the DOM, so to say, doesn't have to be a direct parent. So the second element is just a descendant of the first element, not a direct child. Now this probably is the combinator you use most often. Important about combinators, definitely use them if they allow you to be more precise, but you should be aware that direct selectors without combinators are showing a little bit of a better performance. That being said, it's not like combinators are super bad and it also matters on what you combine. In our code, for example, this combinator here has a pretty good performance because we're very clear about the element. It would be worse if we had the star, for example. And we're then using an ID, which has awesome performance because there aren't many IDs on the page. By the way, performance for classes is also pretty great. So classes, IDs, these have great performance. Combinators which use them also tend to do pretty good. So combinators can be really helpful. This one is probably the combinator you use most often and they allow you to really ensure that you only style the elements in the parts of your app where you want to style them. Now let me comment this out again and let's continue. In this course module, we set some important foundations about the way CSS works and we work with selectors, properties and values. Now, just to bring this back into memory, selectors are things like div, class blog post, id main title, the disabled attribute or the universal selector. Properties are things like background color. We haven't seen that. We used background. It's connected to that, of course, though with color, margin, display. Here are also a couple of properties we haven't used before. We will use them throughout the course. Values then are things like red, percentages, colors and hex codes, pixels, or clearly defined values like block. Again, these are things we will also see throughout this course. Now, if you're wondering, how do you know which properties and which values exist? Let me start with the properties. If you Google for MDN CSS reference, or you use the link you find in the last lecture of this module, you will find this page where you got a basic explanation of the CSS syntax and where you then got this keyword index. Here you see not just the properties CSS knows, but all the things like all pseudo classes and elements, something we hadn't had a look at yet. And this is a great way to finding that specific property you're looking for or finding more information about that property you found in the solution on Stack Overflow, but which you don't fully understand. Now, please, here's one thing you should not do. Don't learn this list by heart. It's way too long. There are properties you don't use at all. And in the end, once you made it through that course and once you start working on project with CSS, you will see that you use the same set of maybe 20 properties all the time. And it's really hard to memorize these. So this is a great reference, but not something you should start learning right now. Just want to point you to it so that you do always know where you can look things up. Now, what about the values though? For one, in the reference I just showed you, if you click on a specific property, you also see how you can configure it and which values it will accept because values are tightly coupled to specific properties. 
you can roughly categorize the types of values into four categories, though there are a bit more some special cases. But here are the four categories I came up with. You get properties that simply use predefined options, something like display block. We didn't learn about this property yet, but this simply is a property. It doesn't use a hex code. It doesn't use a number. It just accepts a couple of predefined values. Overflow auto would be another example. Then you have colors. They work with red, a hex code, or a shorter version of the hex code, and also some special color functions. Something we'll also dive in later. Then we got length, sizes, and numbers, something like pixels or percentages or just integers. Again, all these properties, we'll see them a couple of times throughout the entire course. And last but not least, we got functions, something like a URL where we seem to be using something different than just a color as a background or transformation functions where we can scale or rotate elements, something we'll cover in the transformation module. And of course, there are more values. Again, the reference holds them all and you will see way more in this course. Just wanted to round this up by letting you know where you can find more information and how it is generally works. So that's it for this module. Here's what you learned. You learned that CSS works with rules, which look like this. You have a selector, a property, and a value for the property. You learned that there are different types of selectors, element selectors like H1, class selectors with custom created classes, attribute selectors, which we haven't used yet, but which we at least touched on, ID selectors with custom IDs, and the universal star selector. You learned that there are many properties and values that you can find a complete list on the Mozilla Developer Network, MDN, and there are different types of values, and we will explore way more properties and values throughout the course. We had a look at selectors and combinators so that you can combine multiple selectors to be more precise about which element you want to select. You learned about these four, and you learned, very important, about inheritance and specificity. You learned that parent styles are generally inherited, though there are exceptions. You learned that multiple rules can apply to one and the same element, and that specificity is used to resolve conflicts arising from this multiple rules thing. You also learned that the inheritance defaults can be changed by using that inherit keyword, that inherit value. You remember when we set font family to a value of inherit? Then we override the general behavior that we would not inherit because of specificity, and we did inherit. So that is something which can be changed. This is what we learned thus far. Now we'll dive way deeper into all of that and we'll continue working on our webpage, which still doesn't look super amazing, I'll have to admit. But these were very important foundations on which we can now build up to dive deeper into the internals of CSS and see how it works and then also to, well, continue working on our web page. So let's continue. Welcome to another module. Let's dive deeper into CSS. And if we were to give this module a different title, it would probably be working with boxes. And after this module, you'll also know why. Specifically, we'll dive into the box model a core part of CSS, really easy to understand, thankfully, but really important to know too. So that is what we'll start with. We'll then have a look at how we can actually change the height and width of elements. We'll have a look at the display property, which helps us with layouting our page and positioning elements next to each other, for example. And we'll also dive into properties worth to remember. I mentioned that there is this complete reference of properties and CSS features, which you can always consult if you want to dive deeper. But they're all just a common set of properties you work with a lot. So I want to share some of the properties I personally find to be the most important ones. And finally, we'll have a look at these pseudo classes and elements I already mentioned in the last course section. Now we'll learn what they are and what you can do with them. So with that, let's just get started and let's continue working on our webpage.
So let's continue working on this web page. And I wanna continue with this red block. Right now it doesn't look super impressive. Would be nice if it were a little bit bigger, had more height, maybe some spacing inside of it, and also that white space around it. I wanna get rid of that too. Until we add a navigation bar, this red block should be the very first element on our page without surrounding white space. Now, we can achieve this, we can add all these things, we can control how the block is designed or how much space it takes up by working with the box model. Now, what do I mean with that? Every element in HTML is interpreted as a box by CSS. And you can see that box in the Chrome developer tools if you inspect that element. And again, you can really select any element. So here I selected the H1 element. Now let's pick the section element, but again, any would do it. And if you then at the bottom, scroll down below your styles and the inherited styles, you'll see this box. This is how CSS thinks about an element. Every element has a content, that's the blue area. That's really what's inside of it. So for the section, the content actually is the H1 tag. For the H1 tag, the content is its text. So we got that content, the blue area, and then we can add a padding. Now we got none here indicated by that dash, but we could add a padding, which is some internal space within that section element from the content to the next part, the border. We can add a border to each element. Now we don't have a border here, so we'll add all these things in just a second, of course. A border surrounds an element and directly comes after the padding, which in turn comes directly after the content. Now finally, we sometimes also want to have some spacing around an element, and that would be the margin. It's not part of the core element that ends with the border, including the border but it comes after that. It's the distance you have between that element and its next sibling. For example, the H1 element has a margin by default. It's set by the browser. You can see this if you scroll up to the browser defaults. There you have that strange margin before and after thing. Well, that's just the default browser margin. And there you can see this element happens to have a margin of 19.92 pixels to the top and bottom. That's this orange area, which is also indicated on the top left corner, so here in the loaded page. As you can see already, the margin goes outside of the surrounding section container because it's not part of the element, which in turn is the content of the section. Now, since the margin is not part, it's not part of the content and therefore not part of the section. This is the box model. These layers, the content, the padding, the border, the margin. Every element is interpreted as such a box in CSS. Now, there are two different types of elements then, block level and inline, something I'll cover in this module too, where some of these things will differ a bit, but I'll dive into that. For now, let's simply keep in mind that every element has these layers. Now, let's work with that. We had a look at that box model in theory. Let's now work with it. And let's work with it by going to our product overview selector here, the ID selector where we have the background, and let's add a padding of 20 pixels, for example. So pixels is a unit you can use in CSS. There are other units like percentages and font-related units too, but for now let's stick to pixels since they're very easy to understand. So if we add this and save that file, we can reload the page and now we see that there is some spacing around the text. If we now inspect that section again, we can already see it on the left if we hover over it, that there are different boxes now. And if we now scroll down, we indeed see there is a padding and this time the padding is even around the margin of the H1 tag which can look strange at first since this wasn't considered previously. It's just that if you add a padding, then the content of the element is to be considered the content plus any margins it might have because padding and margins shouldn't overlap, hence the padding is added after the margin of child elements. So here we got our padding 
add it, we can hover over it in the box model to see it highlighted in the top left. And of course we can also add a border now. So let's add a border. Let's add five pixels, black and solid. Now this value might look strange at first, this way of writing a value, we have more than one value. This is called a shorthand. I'll also dive into this in a second. This is just a shorter way of writing border style solid, border color black, border width five pixels, but you could use this notation too. If you add this and reload the page, you see a black border around the element. And if you again scroll down to your box model, you see the five pixels here. And if we hover over it, the border gets highlighted in the top left, so in the loaded page too. Now finally, let's add a margin to complete the box model. If we add a margin here, let's say 20 pixels, and we save that and then we reload the page one more time. Again, if we scroll down, we can see that margin here and if we hover over it, we see that orange margin around our box. We still see some white space to the left and right and that is something I'll revisit very soon too. But with that, we see all layers of the box model in action. Now, there are a couple of special things you also gotta know about the box model and default styles of the web page. So let's dive into these things step by step over the next lectures. We had a look at the box model basics with padding, a border and a margin. And all these things are of course optional. You can have a padding and a margin without a border. You can have a border without a padding and margin. So that's all totally optional. And it leads to that result. Now I mentioned there would be a couple of special things. Now let's dive into these special things step by step. The first special thing can be seen if you inspect the section. There is some white space to the left and to the right, so after the orange margin. This is coming from the body actually. If you hover over the body, you can see the body also has a default margin. Here, the eight pixels. That is simply coming from the browser defaults here. So what we can do to, well, prevent this and to make sure that our elements go directly into the edges of our page, we can set that margin to zero with that margin zero command. If we do that and we reload the page, you see now the body has no longer a margin and therefore if we inspect the section, you indeed see the orange area around it. So its margin directly connects to the edges of the page, which means there is no additional space in between. So that was the first special thing, that the body has a margin. Another special thing can be seen if we inspect the h1 tag in our second section, in the plans section. You see, this has a margin to the top and bottom, the default margin every H1 element has. We can see it here, it's orange. Now the interesting thing is, if we also inspect the section above it, so the product overview section, do you see that orange margin at the bottom of it? Keep in mind where it was. If I go back to the H1 tag, it overlaps with that section from the product overview container. This behavior is called margin collapsing. It simply means the following. If you got two elements, block element with its box model, the margin is the orange part here. If you got two elements next to each other, then margins between them are actually collapsed to one margin. The bigger margin wins. This is not a bug, this is on purpose. This is there or this is enforced by CSS to ensure that you don't get two big distances between the elements. Now you could argue, hey, leave that up to me. I'll take care about that. But that's simply not how CSS works. So it is something to be aware of. To work around this, it's a good practice to use either margin top or margin bottom, unless you don't worry about this collapsing occurring, which of course also can be the case. So in our case, we got some collapsing. It's not really a problem because we got a fine distance between the elements. I just want to highlight it here so that you don't wonder what's going on here. Now that we had a look at the box model, we also implicitly got a first glimpse at shorthand properties. 
To be very precise, we already used shorthand properties since we first started using background. Shorthand properties are simply normal properties that combine the values of multiple other properties in a single property, the so-called shorthand property. Here are some examples. We got some separate properties, let's say. Border width, style and color. This is what we already saw. And style is either dashed or solid, let's say. Now, of course, there are other ways too, like dotted. You can always find all available options in the reference, in the MDN reference for that property. But these are the individual properties that allow you to construct a border. If you only set two of them and omit one, the default for that property will be used, which could lead to no border being displayed or the border being solid even though you want it to be dashed. Well, if you don't specify that, the default will be used. There is a shorthand for this because it's of course a bit more cumbersome to always define a border like this. Border width, style, color, that's a lot to type. Therefore we got shorthands and the shorthand for border would look like this. It's just called border and then we simply assign the values for the different sub properties so to say. The order here doesn't matter as long as the sub properties don't use the same type of value, which isn't the case for border. For other shorthands, it will be the case and I will highlight this and tell you how to circumvent this once it is the case. So for border, we could mix the order of the arguments here of the values in whichever way we want. The core is that this will be interpreted in exactly the same way as it is on the left. Another example would be margin. We didn't even use that notation until now. We used the one where we just had margin, colon, and then 20 pixels. Now actually the margin has a couple of shorthands. It's always just margin, but you could write it like this, and this would read as top, right, bottom, and left. So this is a shorter way of setting the margins for the different directions. If you wanna set top and bottom and left and right to the same, you could use this notation. The first value is then set for the top and bottom margin, the second one for left and right. And if you want to use the same margin on all sides, as we did it, then you would use margin with one value. Now this will be applied to all sides. These are shorthand properties. We use a lot of shorthands in CSS and I will always mention them once we use one or once we can use one. Again, we already did it for background. I'll dive deeper into what background uh, covers or which other values are part of background later in the course once we also add background images. It's important that you should use shorthands if you have the chance to do so, simply because it's cleaner and shorter code. But you can always use the longer version. And what you can also do is you can define a shorthand version and later, let's say in another class with a higher specificity, you could override one part of that if you, for example, want to keep the border color and only change the width, you'd define the border shorthand first and then in the overwriting rule, you'd just define the border width. It would still take the old setup from the shorthand and then only override that single part of it. So that's also a nice way of working with shorthands. But again, this will all be something we see in the course. Let's quickly see shorthands in action then. As I said, we already use shorthands. The background is a shorthand. The padding actually is a shorthand. It works like the margin. Margin is one. Here we use the longer form. Now we can get rid of that and instead simply use border, five pixels, solid black, or any other order of these values. The margin here, of course, is a shorthand. And with that, Let's inspect that in the developer tools and see how they can help us with that. If we again select the first section where we have padding, border, margin and background, so where we already have four shorthands, in the developer tools you can always click this tiny arrow here to see which long form properties are combined. Now here you see all the properties that make up the background. Again, this is something I'll dive into later. This is simply a very well complex way since you can also use background images which you can then position with the various sub properties. For solid colors they don't matter. But there you see we implicitly set background color by assigning a color to background. So this would be the long form property name, background color. 
for the padding, we see that this could be split up into padding top, right, bottom, and left. And it works, as I said, just like the margin. And for the border, we see actually we got a bit more. We don't just have border style, color, and width. We can even set long form properties for the different sides. So for the top border, we could style that differently than the bottom border. So this is how the short ends are combined here. And this is just something to be aware of. You can always use the long form. And if you just want to set a margin top, for example, it's better to just set margin top rather than margin with the four value syntax and then set three of them to zero. But you can always use both and behind the scenes, this is what will get rendered. Enough about the shorthands, let's go back to code. I will remove the margin, border, and for now also the padding of the product overview. So if we save this and reload, we're back to where we were. Well, with one difference, we no longer have the margin implied by the body. That white space to the top is coming from the H1 element. Now we can also set something different. We can set a width and a height. So on the product overview, we can set the width to 100%, for example, to tell it to take the full entire width of this page. Now, if we reload, we don't really see a change because that was its default behavior anyways, because sections like divs or like h1 elements are block level elements. Now, this is some HTML feature not related to CSS, but it's important to keep in mind block level elements, unlike inline elements like anchor tags, for example, block level elements always take the full available width by default. So width 100% actually doesn't do anything. If we set it to something different than 100% though, let's say to 50, then we can see that if we reload, this shrinks our box to 50% of the width of the surrounding container. Here it looks like 50% of the page width, and it is the case, but that's simply happening because the surrounding container is a main element, which also is a block level element, which therefore has a width of 100%. So 50% of the surrounding container, which has 100% of the page width, yields 50% of the page width here too. But if the main element had a lower width too, then the section would only get half of that. So width can be used either with percentages or of course with absolute values like 300 pixels. This is also possible and this shrinks the box. If I increase that to let's say 700, you'll see it gets bigger like that. So this is the width we can set and this will become important throughout the course because we don't want all elements to be 100% of the page width. We can also set the height of course. Now for the height it's tricky. If you set height 100% and you expect it to now get the height of the full page, well you're going to be sad. As you can see it now only got a little bit bigger. The only thing it now does is it includes the height of the margin of the H1 element. The reason for that is that 100% refers to the available height given by the parent container. Now, if you hover over the main container, you could see, well, the blue area is much bigger than the tiny bit our red box grow by. But that area, that height of the main element is calculated dynamically by the content it holds. So it's only as big as its content requires it to be. Now that of course creates kind of an infinite loop. If we say a part of the content should be 100% of the size of the main area and the main area says I'm only as big as I need to be, then the 100% basically has no effect. If you wanted it to have an effect, you would need to change the height of the main area too. So if I do this here in the developer tools, which only will change it temporarily until we refresh the page, I could set the height of the main area to let's say 500 pixels. And if we do that, you can inspect the section here and you will see on the top left, you can see it, that it now has a height of 500 pixels, exactly the height we set on the main area. So if we give this an explicit height, then the child, if we use percentages, will again refer to that, just as it's the case with the width. If we set the height of the main area to 
we're now referring to its parent, which is the body, and that again is only as big as it needs to be. So we got the same situation as before. So only if we set the body to a height 100% too, and we do the same for HTML, which is the parent of the body, which is only as big as it needs to be. So now if we set this to 100% on HTML2, now we finally get a red area that is just as big as our page. Because now starting at the HTML element, which now refers to the overall window if we set height to 100%, we pass the relative height of 100% down to that section. So if you ever want to style the height of an element relative to the height of your page, you need to create such a chain where you pass the page height down. In the dimensions and units section later in the course, we'll also learn about a different, more modern unit, which allows you to achieve this a bit easier, with worse browser support though. But for now, this is a cool trick to keep in mind, how you can set the height to 100%. Now this is not necessarily what I wanna do here though, I can simply set this to an absolute value. For example, we could set this to a value of, let's say 528 pixels. If we now reload, this is the size our red area has. I'll also set the width back to 100%, though I could omit this because that's the default anyways, but for now I'll leave it here so that we have that for reference. So that is how width and height work in general. We can use them with percentages or pixels or other units, which we'll cover later. But there's actually a bit more to width and height, especially if we consider the box model. Let's dive into that in the next lecture. So in the last lecture, we worked with height and width. Well, that's all nice. We changed the height and width of the box, unsurprisingly. But what exactly did we change? When we set the height and the width, did we set the height and width of the content, of the content plus the padding, of the content, the padding, and the border, or of the content, the padding, the border, and the margin? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look by inspecting that section where we did set width and height. There, if we scroll down to our box model, what we can see is that in there, we set the width and height of our box here, I'd say. The width is calculated dynamically as we increase and decrease the page width because it's set to 100%, and the height is the 522 pixels we added in our code. But let's now quickly add some padding back to the party. Let's maybe add a padding of 10 pixels, a border of 5 pixels solid and black, and a margin of 10 pixels. If we now save this and we reload the page, we can already see one strange thing. It shifted a little bit to the right. The 100% width leads to our red element to go out of the right side of our page. And that doesn't change if we decrease and increase the page width because it's already set to 100%. So something seems to be wrong with the width. If we scroll down to our box model again, we now see something strange. The height really is 528 pixels for the content. The width is 100% of our content too. But now the padding, border, and margin add up to that. So what we actually now got is a total width and height that's bigger than what we specified. And we can see the total values if we simply hover over it. We can see that the actual width of our element is 937 and that the actual height is 558. Now if we go back to our box model here in the developer tools, the height was 558. Well, if we add up, that's 528 plus 10, plus 10, so 548, plus 5, plus 5. So we set the height and width of the content and padding and border is not included into our calculation or is not part of what width and height target. It is what the browser in the end adds up to it though, which leads to our element being positioned incorrectly. This happens because all elements 
by default happen to have a certain way of calculating width and height, which is called content box. We can set this behavior by adding the box sizing property to the element where we want to change it. And as I said, the default here is content box. This means if we set a width and height, we set width and height of the content, not of the entire box, including padding and border. We can set it to border box though. Now width and height include padding and border. They don't include the margin and we can't make it to include that. With that set, however, if we save the file and reload, we still see that the element goes out of the page because the margin is not included in the calculation. But if we go down, we see that actually it now only has a height of 498 because now if we add 10 times two for the padding and five times two for the border, now we end up with the 528, which is our height, which now again targets content plus padding plus border. And that often is the setting you wanna use. It's actually so common that you often override the styling for all your elements to always use box sizing border box because it's more convenient to think of the height and width referring to the entire box without margin than to just the content. Now, as I said, margin is never included. So to avoid that effect where your element is moved to the left, you simply have to remove the margin, which I guess makes sense. If you want your element to sit right on the edge, don't add a margin after your element. It makes sense that this is not part of the width and height. So box sizing, border box, really, really useful. And as I said, so important and useful that it's often used as a default style for all elements anyways. And this is also what I want to do here. So we could add it to body. And if we do that and save and reload the page and go back to the box model, hmm, we see we're back in content box world. The reason for this is that we're now inheriting the box sizing setup, but actually we don't see it here as a browser default style but because it's a block level element here by default, this is overridden automatically. So actually our nice inheritance doesn't take effect because the browser sets its own box sizing because section is a block level element. Therefore, what we have to do is we have to use the universal selector. And that is one of the rare cases where you really use it. If you wanna reset all elements, to have a certain behavior, like using box sizing border box, then you use the star, the universal selector, because this is now not using inheritance. It's not using the same mechanism as uh, setting this on body head. It's really targeting every element on its own, hence overwriting inheritance and also overwriting browser defaults and sets the box sizing to border box. And I will leave this for the entire course project because I always want to target content, padding, and border when setting width and height. So with that added, if we now reload and go back, we see we're back in a world where our content is only width and height without padding and border, so that if we set a width or height, we actually include padding and border in the calculation. So with all that theory out of the way, it's time to continue working on our course project and make sure we take the next major step when it comes to that. And for that, I'll first of all, get rid of that ugly border, get rid of that margin we don't need, and yeah, I'll leave the padding for now, I guess. So if we save this and reload, this is what we end up with. Looks a bit nicer. Now I wanna add a navigation bar too. And for that, I attached a file where you find some HTML code which will now add to our index HTML file. There, above the main section, we'll paste in the code you find in that attached file, which is a header element with some div inside of it, with a nav element, which then in turn has an unordered list with list items that should become our application navigation. This is some typical markup which you might see in this form or slight variations in your web pages. Here are some links. They all won't work for now, but we'll add these pages throughout the course. And if we save that, and also save the updated main.css file, of course, and reload it, 
we got this ugly part at the top. Now our goal for the next lectures will be to turn this into a non-ugly part. So we'll add our header. And we can start by simply selecting the header element itself. Now of course what we can do is we can now simply add header like this. We can target the header element by the element selector. The downside of this is that we might use multiple headers in a web page. It's not limited to the navigation. The header element actually can also be used within a section, for example. So therefore, using header here is not really the best way. Would be better to define our own class. So I'll add main dash header. The class name is totally up to you, but it should be descriptive. And here I name it main header because I believe this clearly indicates this is the main header of our page, not some section header or anything like that. Now this class, of course, needs to be attached to the header element then. So let's go to the HTML code and add the main header class. So now the main header is defined such that we can start using or can start styling it. Now which styles can we attach here? Of course any styles you want, but I want to create a header which spans the full width, which has a green background color as this will be kind of the main theme color our application will use. Of course you're always free to choose a different one. And I also want to give it some padding so that the text in the header or the content of the header doesn't directly sit on its edges. Now that is a good practice for you. The goal is to add a background color, to add some padding, and set the width to the full page width. These are all things we already practiced, so here's your chance to pause the video, and then do this on your own. And after you unpause, we'll do it together. Were you successful? Let's do it together. To set the width to 100%, we simply add width 100%. And this is kind of optional because it's a block level element. It takes the full entire width anyways, but it's still something we can set up, especially as we later in the course will revisit this and style this differently where this will actually become important. Now, besides that, we want to set a background color. Now I mentioned I want to use a green and maybe you just used green, which is fine, but I prepared a special hex code, a nice green I personally like, and it's 2DD F5C. Of course you're free to choose any green you want. It's the same green we used for the section title though. Finally, some padding. Now here I'll add a padding to top and bottom and left and right, but I want to use different values. I want to use the same padding for the top and the bottom and the same padding for the left and the right, but not the same padding for top, bottom, left and right. So what we can do is we can use this two value shorthand I showed you in an earlier slide. And I'll set the padding to top and bottom to 8 pixels and to left and right to 16 pixels, like this. If we now save this and we reload the page, we got that green header. We also see that our text doesn't directly touch the edges anymore. From a styling perspective, we can still improve this a bit in my opinion though. For example, this unordered list doesn't look that great. And by the way, if you don't like that color edge here, we'll also replace the red color with the image later on. So let's continue with the header though. We made a great first step, but the list items positioned like this, that's not really helpful. We don't want to have a list rendered like that. We just want to use a list semantically, but from a styling perspective, all these list items should sit next to each other, not on top of each other. Now to achieve this, we'll actually need to dive into a new property, the display property. Let's explore it in the next lecture. I hope you liked the video. Of course it ends rather abruptly, that is because it's a course excerpt. If you liked it, if you want to learn more, I'd of course be more than happy to welcome you in the full course to which you can find a link in the video description with a huge discount attached to it of course. And if you already are a CSS pro, I'd be more than happy to welcome you in the other videos on this YouTube channel and our website academy.com. See you there hopefully, bye.